Hi, everyone. You all quieted down quickly. You're a very cooperative audience, so thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Nasher. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and I will be introducing our speakers today. We are here on the penultimate day of the Nasher's Lenda Bengley's exhibition, which has quite literally dazzled us all summer. The work on view is gorgeous and appealing, but more importantly, is built on a rich foundation of Bengley's work prior and her place in the canon of contemporary art. Joining us to unpack this work is Dr. Catherine Caesar, who's been teaching at the University of Dallas since 2003. Completing her doctorate from Emory University in 2005, Dr. Caesar's research in recent years has focused on the art of the 1960s and 70s, in particular currents in both feminist and conceptual art, and specifically the work of Martha Rosler, Adrienne Piper, and Eleanor Anton. Her dissertation and her recent publication submissions have centered around critic Lucy Lepard and the development of her notion of women's conceptualism in her writings and exhibitions. Recently, Dr. Caesar has been investigating the notion of aerial art and Robert Smithson's 1966 project for Dallas-Fort Worth Regional Airport and women artists' use of journals and newspapers as exhibition spaces. In conversation with Dr. Caesar is Dr. Lee Arnold, Associate Curator at the Nasher Sculpture Center and Exhibition Curator for Lenda Bengley's. Dr. Arnold has previously curated Elm Green and Dragset Sculptures, the first major US museum exhibition of work by the artist duo, and Sightings and La Trotter, the French sound artist's first exhibition in North America and her first work in the English language. Arnold is currently working on a historical reinterpretation of land art that focuses on women who are involved in the movement. She received her PhD from the University of da Texas Dallas in 2016, where she wrote on Robert Smithson's unfinished projects in Texas. I look forward to a thoughtful exchange today, so please join me now in welcoming Catherine Caesar and Lee Arnold. Uh, let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, green thank you. button. Green to advance, red to go back. There you go. I don't know what this work is called, um, but it references, oh, I know, it's lanyap. Do you guys know what a lanyap is? No. Um, it means a free thing um, in Louisiana. And I just wanted to start out talking about Linda Benglis because um, she and I went to the same college in Louisiana and that's where she comes from. She went to Newcomb College um, so did I for my master's. And so I want to start talking about her sculpture as kind of this place of origin for her. Um, not all of it reflects Louisiana in any way, but uh, I wanted to start out there. Wait, before you go on. Please. Uh, this is, I've never seen this image. This work is amazing. <laughs> uh, but also it reminds me of this quote um, that we got of Linda talking about sparkly things, um, especially this form, which has this kind of like pom-pom on the end of it. But she says, I grew up with sparkly things like my dance baton and my bright pink girl's dance costume. And I loved those things, I still do. Why should, we, why should what we're naturally drawn to be conditioned out of us? So she was really talking about how like, People love sparkly things. People love sparkly things. <laughs> I know I do. Um, and this looks like a dance baton to me, kind of. I am so glad you said that. <laughs> and this is going to be a conversation between Lee and myself. So we're just going to go back and forth. And then we'll leave time at the end for questions. Yep. What I want to talk about um, and again, I hope Lee interjects as needed for the first part, is um, our Linda Benglis's influences, or at least what I see as her influences. So she has this wonderful piece out in the garden. What's it called? Bounty Fruited Plain, Amber Waves Fruited Plain. So it's a fountain. 
and she's been really interested in this. So I'm showing you one of her fountain pieces. Um, and she talks about the flow of water and how it relates to her work. Um, she also likes her pieces to be in ideal, in an ideal world, site-specific, so that the water sources can inform her work. Um, but I wanted to compare it to the work, and this has been done before, um, to the work of Constantin Brancusi, who was a Romanian sculptor of the modern period, um, early to mid 20th century. Um, and so I'm showing you some images of his endless column. Um, so think about when you see Benglis's work outside, um, how it might relate to that, but also how it incorporates water and how we consider it. I'm showing you an image from one of her videos. And because Benglis worked in a lot of different media. Um, she worked in photography, she worked in video, she's primarily known for her sculpture right now, she worked in painting. Um, but this is an image from, I forget the year, um, let me look. I think it was in the 70s when she started making her films, right? I think so too. Um, I just want to get my... Um, yes, it's in the early 70s. And um, it's an image of her kissing another woman. Images and notions of gender were really important in her work. And I think they continue to be so, even though it might not be as evident. Mm -hmm as it is, um, as it was in the 1970s. Although some might say the work in the garden are three giant phalluses. And their intense verticality, she, it was kind of a statement for her to put those up on view next to Richard Serra's My Curves Are Not Mad with that intense horizontality. And yet hers is bigger. So it's like a, Measuring contest. And you and, <laughs> you and I have talked about images of the phallus yeah. in, um, in Linda Benglis' work. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say it. Like, <laughs> my, my work on Benglis has primarily focused on the images that she produced for Art Forum magazine in 1974. And they were in response to an artist that I'm about to show you named Robert Morris, who had a, a he, was, he was advertising one of his exhibitions. And he was dressed in S&M clothing, leather, et cetera. And um, so in response, to, in part to those images, Benglis put together a series of photographs of herself, the most famous one being a nude herself, a self-portrait. Um, and she is, again, nude, but showing an enormous dildo, you know, like this. <laughs> And so gender has been really important throughout her career. So it's interesting to think about the fountains as phalluses. I never thought about that before. <laughs> Do you think that's tr might I be think true? I think that's true. I mean, um, there was a very, very much there was an aesthetic in the 70s that she was tapping into, which was, you know, provocative, um, using right. her body. Right. Um, but I think her body has always been a part of her process, um, but in less representational ways. It's about the physicality, the movement that was required of her to make her first painting, you know, fallen paintings, then to go on to pour the foam sculptures. Um, and so I think that the body is always a part of her work. 
And there have been moments where she's really kind of emphasized her own physical body in a representational way to be provocative. But um, it's you can see her body kind of present throughout. Even these sculptures, which I think are titled The Graces, they they evoke to me a, a torso. You know? Me too. And they also make me think of the caryatids that are, um, you know, on. I don't know which building they are, but in Greece, you know. The, the Erechtheion on yes. the part at, at the Acropolis. So um, even, if, even in these more abstracted ways, the body becomes a part of it. But it's oftentimes a feminine representation, but then also, the foul, so it's, you know, it's both. So, but what do you think about the pink and the glitter? Pink and glitter, it's... Um, is that inherently fem uh, feminine? I mean, this is something that we, the artists were really pushing against in the '70s when there, you know, the feminine art, be you know, developed, and there became this thing called the feminine aesthetic, which was really derogatory because that's kind of categorizing. Because we're merely feminine. Exactly. Yes, and so it's this is Bengalis, like. I can be both. I don't have to be one or the other. I don't have to just make work that challenges um, Richard Serra. <laughs> I can make work that I like to look at, that's sparkly, that's fun. Um, you may call it decorative, which was also another Merely decorative. Yeah, yes. merely decorative, which was another way to denigrate um, certain artistic styles, but you know, when Frank Stella was using glitter, did people people did call them decorative, but you know he wasn't ever accused of being part of a feminine aesthetic. Um, and they were making works with glitter at the same time, but because Linda was a, a woman, it suddenly threw her into a category of making work at, in a feminine way. And so then you push back by making something that is monumental, um, large or monochromatic, um, so you push back in certain ways. And I think that's what she's been doing kind of her whole career, pushing back. One of the things that Lee and I have talked about on the phone was, um, um, I'm going to show you one of Eva Hess's work. Um, Eva Hess is a post-minimalist artist, and Linda Benglis is closely associated with, those movement, with that movement, if we can call it a movement. Um, in the 1970s. And um, Eva Hess, she was interviewed by um, an author and a feminist named Cindy Nemser. And she wrote a book in 75 called Art Talk. And in that book, um, she interviews all of these artists, um, including Eva Hess, and she sent like a postcard to Eva Hess saying, will you please be interviewed for this book? And she said, it's going to be about feminism. It's going to be about your role as a woman artist. And Eva Hess very famously wrote back to uh, Cindy Nemser and said, excellence has no sex which is a quote from Simone de Beaufort. So she's not identifying herself as being a woman artist, mm -hmm. right? But um, she's not denying it at the same time, but she's saying, if I make excellent art, it's excellent. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be categorized as a female artist, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on to a couple more. I'll skip those. <laughs> I, I think this is fun to talk about just the use of color. What were you going to say? Uh, you talk first about oh. color, and then I'll <laughs> go on. Because earlier you were like, what about the pink? What about the glitter? Um, and you know, when Bangladesh started making these works, this is Hey Helen Frankenthaler. It's on the collection of the DMA. I think it was right. on view very recently. I don't think it's on view any longer. No. Um, but uh, just one of a number of these works where she was pouring um, pigmented, pigmented latex paint directly onto the floor. 
um, often using day glow colors. They were really bright. Um, some people described them as garish, extravagant. Curators complained that it didn't play well with others. So there's this great story at, about her um, contribution to the Whitney Biennial. Was it the Biennial? I think so. Yeah, and it, Contraband is the name of the work right. that is now in the Whitney's collection. And not this work. No, not this work. But, but another one exactly. like this. Contraband, yes. this is... Um, uh, Odalisk. Odalisk K. Helen Frankenthaler is the Yes. Name, right? Yeah, okay. So, um, but Contraband, imagine something similar to this work. An, another poured painting on the floor. Um, the contraband is incredibly long. I, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but it's over 20 feet, I believe, in length. And um, Linda poured it directly on the floor in, in the place where it was meant to be displayed as part of the exhibition. And the colors she chose were probably very similar to Odalisk here. And um, the curators, without her consent, moved it out of the gallery where she had poured it and intended for it to be viewed into kind of this kind of transitional space, not really part of the show. And this, you know, quite rightly angered Bengalis, but also was disappointing. And they, they said, you know, it just doesn't work well in this exhibition. And so she ended up pulling it from the show. So it was primarily color-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, they called it, huh. it didn't play well with others because think about the time that, uh, I think Contraband was for the 70, 70s sculpture biennial. It was an earlier, definitely within the 70s. Early 70s. Yeah, and it was among in this moment where sculpture was, you know, very much just like the high point of minimalist sculpture. And when you think of minimalist sculpture, you think of monochromatic industrial materials, a heavy emphasis on austere, you know, austerity um, forms that are um, geometric forms, replicated forms. Um, you think of Donald Judd and you think silver boxes or plywood boxes or um, Solowit. You don't think oozing pink and green and yellow flowing out onto the floor. Unless uh, you were a California minimalist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is just, that's just an anecdote of kind of what she was up against um, right. when she was making this work. And honestly, I think that experience led her to kind of switch away from just painting, which was throwing the color on the floor, um, and starting to experiment more with foam, which gave volume and mass to these fallen paintings and became sculpture. What were you gonna say about? Um, so, uh, Judy Chicago, you might know her work. Um, she talked about in her book, um, Through the Flower, that um, she kind of felt forced into being a minimalist mm. um, because that was what was selling and showing at the time. And uh, this was circa 1966. She showed in a really important uh, minimalist exhibition called Primary Structures. And, um, but later when she wrote this book, she said, I was forced into it and I felt like it was a truly masculine movement, style, obdurate, <laughs> hard, right? Um, rigid. <laughs> rigid, exactly. And so she moved away from it. Now, I don't know how Benglis fits into that, I mean, when I look at this work, I think about Jackson Pollock, painting on the ground, of course. Um, I think about Linda Benglis is not Californian, but I think about um, California minimalism and how it was rigid and obdurate, but also colored. Um, I think about the movement of her body, mm -hmm. right, through the artwork, but it's also called Odalisk. Mm -hmm. Um, and odalisque in French refers to a, a, basically a prostitute in a Turkish harem, but it has also become now known as a reclining nude. So even though we see this very abstract design, 
you know, can you see a body within it? Does it refer to a female reclining nude? What do you think? I think so. <laughs> but I also think that, I mean, it can refer to a body, but it can also refer to bodily fluids, bodily processes. Yeah. And that, I think, really becomes apparent when you get into the foam sculptures and really a lot of her work. <laughs> I mean, a fountain is expelling water out of the top of it. So when you say bodily fluids, <laughs> are we thinking menstruation here? That, you know, that would other be things? one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so the water relates to that. I think so. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Um, okay, let's keep going. So I'm just comparing it to Carl Andre, and I'm not the only one that does this. But we know that Carl Andre creates these metal pieces created out of aluminum and other sorts of types of metal. And um, he's interested in seriality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Eva Hess said very famously about him that she was really close friends with Carl Andre, and she called his art a concentration camp. I don't know what we think about that, Yikes. but <laughs> just <laughs> please just to, uh, take us take us away from that. <laughs> Let's go. Um, I, I think um, Bengalis was also super, very much informed by Andre's by Andre. Work. Yes, and uh, very fond of him. I think they were fast yes. friends when she moved to New York in the okay. mid sixties. Um, and they were close enough that she dedicated a work to, in his name, which is the, the foam sculpture that's in the collection of the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Okay. Yeah, which I don't have a slide for you all. I'm so sorry. But I think it's on view pretty frequently, so you're welcome to go check that out. Actually, I have a process slide. When we get to it, I'll mention it. Okay. But um, there is a work dedicated to Carl Andre um, just over in Fort Worth of Benglis's. And it is, it's a foam pour. And it's kind of funny because when you think of Andre again, you think of rigid, monochromatic, obdurate. geometric, obdurate. And obdurate this one doesn't is, just mean hard. It means like there's no give. It, it, and, but also that it doesn't include the artist's own subjectivity. Yes. And the, the work that um, you'll see some process images of it later on it's it's like a slumping foam sculpture in a corner that's kind of sad. <laughs> that is, and, that uh, is dedicated <laughs> to him, right? Yeah, and it's but it's in um, black and dark gray and like it's in this similar color palette that you would think, oh yeah, Andre, but you would never think Andre when you look at it because it's it's so oozy and without form. Right. The the form came from the material. It wasn't imposed on the material. The material chose that form, right? Because it's the foam that right. as it's, you know, as she's pouring it on, it finds its, you know, place where it then it ridges, becomes more rigid and that's, that's the form it chooses rather than Linda imposing it. And it's also bodily. Totally bodily. Um, so, um, <laughs> Thank you for moving us away from the concentration camp. <laughs> um, but um, a lot of people compare Benglis's work to Andre's because it's on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, at least that series of Benglis's works. Um, and just what I want to say about this kind of comparison is that this is a different way of viewing artwork. Right, so here at the Nasher, we have things on walls, we have artworks on pedestals. These are artworks that you look down upon. And with the Andres, you can walk on them. You're allowed to. And so, um, not the Benglis. You can't. You can't <laughs> walk on those. Please don't. Um, and so, but I think that Benglis, like some of the minimalists, including Andre, is thinking about just a different perception of artwork. 
and that you are looking past your body mm -hmm. and viewing the artwork rather than just at eye level or whatever the case may be. So, but also involving your body exactly. in the viewing of it, this proprioceptive response to looking at a work of art rather than this kind of static taking in of it, you're having to move your body around to understand it, right? That's exactly like, right. Look down rather than look straight forward or look up. You know? Right, so you see all of this yes. <laughs> you look at the piece and yeah. you think about yourself. Yeah. Um, Robert Morris, who I'm gonna show you in a second, talked about the phenomenological response mm. to an artwork where it's experiential and the meaning takes place between your body and the artwork. And so this is kind of a new way of viewing it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going. Hmm. Which one is this one? Quartered Meteor. Thank you. <laughs> um, so what I wanna talk about are corner pieces for Linda Benglis, and I wanna give it and I want to talk quickly because I, I don't want to take time away from the current no. exhibition. Everybody can see the exhibition upstairs, <laughs> which is what we hope you do. So let's, um, let's take some time to unpack corner. So what I want to talk about is this, and, and am, am I plugged in anymore? Does it matter? Okay. So <laughs> um, what I want to talk about is what the corner means what could be kind of more boring than talking about corner pieces. But it's actually really interesting art historically and it's something that Benglis taps into. Um, so why place a piece in the corner? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you in a second. Mm -hmm. um, because it could be in the middle of the floor, maybe this is site specific, right? So we could talk about the notion of site specificity. Um, but I want to talk about, again, this tension between Benglis's notion of process and form and creation, but also this like subtle political and gender dimension within her work. Okay, so I've got some kind of yucky, I mean, not good quality images here that I'm going to show you. But uh, I want to start talking about Russian constructivism. I know that's not what you came for, right? But um, Russian constructivism is a movement that occurred um, starting basically after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And um, artists like Vladimir Tatlin created corner pieces. Okay, so what? It's just abstract structure, structures that appear in the corner. He's not the only one. El Lizitsky did it. Um, other artists did it during this time period. But they, first of all, they were creating abstract artwork that, um, because in part, they were communists. And they felt that abstraction could appeal to everybody, the masses. You didn't, have, you didn't have to have any identifying qualities. You didn't have to be instructed in the fine arts. You could just realize form through abstract devices. Here we have relatively geometric forms that you see here. So we all get it. Now, do we all? I don't know. But um, that was their intention. But they were creating corner pieces because it subtly changed the shape of the room. Mm -hmm. And again, like, so what, right? But artwork became now installational because it created, because it changed the shape of the room you started to think about the environment that you existed in. Mm -hmm. It was a social space and maybe even a political space because it wasn't just something flat against the wall. It, 
you started to think about the room that you were existing in, and then maybe you started to think about the world that you existed in, your environment. So it became social, it became political, just by existing in a corner. Terrible image. I had to take a screenshot because this work doesn't exist anymore. But it's George Brock, if you know him, he was a cubist, um, worked hand in hand with uh, Pablo Picasso. Um, and so he's just creating a typical cubist scene of like a cafe table with a bottle of wine and whatever else. But again, it's a corner space. And so he, this is 1914. Um, he's not the only artist that is thinking about this. And then there's Robert Morris. This is his first solo exhibition in 1963 at the Green Gallery in New York. Um, plywood structures that we already talked about a little bit. Um, not, not filled with color. He wanted the most neutral structures humanly possible, right? Um, and he wanted it to be, again, phenomenological and experiential. And so we walk through that space on the left-hand side and we walk under that, um, what he called the slab on the right-hand side. We look down at that, you know, that long structure. But then he has the corner piece in that space. So why do artists keep doing this? <laughs> um, the minimalist, Robert Morris was part of what we call the minimalist movement. Um, they, want, they were very influenced by Russian constructivism. And so meaning came about because these are the most neutral structures that you can create. And the minimalist artists didn't even make their artwork mm -hmm. anymore when they could afford it. Right, um, it went out to contractors. Um, but so the meaning came through by changing the shape of the space and it made it like a social and political space. So I don't know, Lee, I don't know if you feel like Benglis is doing that type of thing. I really liked what you said about how the putting a sculpture, putting a work of art in a corner changes your experience of the room because I, I Think about what Linda's doing with Quartered Meteor, for example, in terms of architectural space, but I didn't think about that from it that from I didn't think about it from that perspective. I was thinking about it a corner of, first of all, she's riffing with Morris, I think. Um, I think so too. They, you know, it, can we go to we know that she is. We know that she from is. the art forum ads. Right. <laughs> we know that she is from the art forum ads be, that they were riffing on each other. Right. Um, um, certainly, she was v aware. She knew her art history, so she would have been very aware of what constructivists had been doing. Right. Um, but I'd always thought about um, quartered meteor. Do we? Have, there we go. This is on view upstairs too. Um, and we can talk about why it's um, pulled away from the wall, um, which I, I guess I'll just talk about right now. Yeah. So I thought about, <laughs> I thought about Quartered Meteor, um, which began as a foam sculpture here on the left hand slide, side of the slide. You see um, its original, original form in foam. And it was site specific. It was poured into a corner. And for me, I thought about architecture in the terms of those two walls, that corner became a, a buttress. They became buttresses for this material. So it allowed her to build up the form to greater heights because it had this material behind it, supporting it. Um, and so she was yeah. riffing with right. Morris, but yeah. she was also Thinking, That's like Sarah throwing his. Yeah, so thinking functionally too, and how can I, how can I build this up so it has a little bit greater of height, but I'm not sacrificing anything else in terms of the materials that I'm working. So with. it was functional. I think so. Yeah. But um, 
But I do think that she was interested in changing your experience of a space. I mean, she goes on to make these incredible, sorry everybody, we're gonna jump forward quite a bit to these, oh, here we go. These works, um, which she basically did like a, a, a statewide tour, or a, a tour across America, basically, of going to different university art galleries, other And making art the work there. Making the work on site. They were these cantilevered forms in foam. And um, they became, it, this was just like another step for her. So she builds up the form using the corner, to me. And then she, the next step is, OK, I want to go off the wall. Now that I've gone into the wall and built up from the walls, I want to go off the wall, which is what she ends up doing um, with these cantilevered forms in foam. But going back to quartered meteor, um, I've always thought of it in terms of architecture because in terms of this is a specific, site-specific sculpture. King of Flot was in 1969. And she poured it into that place. It became a cast of that specific corner yeah, of, yeah. The, of the location. I think it was a, an, a friend's studio. Yeah. Um, and I guarantee if you were to be able to look on the underside of the foam, you would have seen you know, a cast the of the floorboards. Of, yeah. um, so she did a number of these foam sculptures. Um, and they were all kind of, they were site specific when she created them. But then when she would show them. She would take them to she another would, space. She would take them to another space. Not only that, but um, Paula Cooper, there's this great show. I don't have an image, I'm so sorry. But there's a, a great image of this King of Flot on view at Paula Cooper Gallery in the middle of the gallery. Because she didn't want to force it into a corner that wasn't the original corner. So where so is it she, in, in the Paula Cooper show? In the middle of the floor. It is. Yeah. And so it was this idea that she created a site-specific sculpture, but then she's able to also kind of put it everywhere. But it's still site-specific in that it's this cast of a very specific yeah. <laughs> architectural space, right? Um, she goes on. This King of Flot was destroyed to make... Um, what would become Quartered Meteor, she starts casting in metals in the mid-1970s, partially um, due to a Guggenheim Memorial Foundation grant. Um, and then, you know, we can talk about metal casting and her work, but um, we show the work upstairs, um, Quartered Meteor, away from the wall because she's asked us to, and because for her, that Quartered Meteor, with its lineage to King of Flot, is is a site-specific work. If you can't show it in the exact place where it was originally poured, then it's not meant to be shoved into just any old corner. So it's pulled away from the wall. But, to but you an can't walk around it. No. It's just pulled away. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it just makes me think about Richard Serra and his castings where he throws lead mm -hmm. and then pulls in. Um, Leo Castelli's gallery, and um, he pulls it away from the wall, but then he takes it and it exhibits it in yeah. other places. Yeah. Right. Um, OK, I think that we should move on to okay. some of the newer work. Sure. I just wanted to point out, yep. earlier I had mentioned there's this foam sculpture in the Moderns collection in Fort Worth. This is, these are photographs um, of Linda making this. So you can see she used a corner in their building. It is a corner foam pour, which they do push into any old corner when they put it on view. Um, but because the building where she poured it originally no longer, they, you know, they built the Tadao Ondo building in what, 2001? Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So these are, just, just to show you this process, um, she has all these different buckets. She's combining the materials to um, create the foam that she then pours, and it's a very physical process. Um, a little bit of, a little tidbit of knowledge, 
Tom Orr, who's an artist based in the area I'm sure many of you are familiar with, we believe is the gentleman standing behind Linda on the right-hand side. Of really? It. Yeah. He was working with Janie C. Lee Gallery, uh, which was uh, a gallery active in Dallas for probably five or six years in the 70s. Um, she did a show with Linda in 1970, and yeah. Tom was working for Janie C. Lee, and he became like an artist assistant, yeah. so he would just drive Linda. And while Linda was in town for this show, she was also being commissioned to do a work at the Modern, and then also did a work for a private collection. She made some foam pours in Janie C. Lee's swimming pool, which, I mean, that's amazing. In the swimming pool? In the swimming pool. I have, a, I have an image, but I can't show it to anybody because it's coming out in this really gorgeous book that the studios. <laughs> <laughs> but it, maybe I'll show it to some of you if you want after this talk. Um, but she's, so that's like, so Tom was kind of witness to all of this. And he also, he's very like self deprecating and will say, oh, I was just there. I didn't really help. But I mean, he's like, yeah, I would just put a bucket where she needed it if she needed to clean something out. So we're, we're kind of hoping that that's Tom. And, you know, anyway. Yes. So, um, where, 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 where are Let's we? Let's talk about the, the work that's in the exhibition. Sure. And, and uh, you get started, and then I'll give my feedback. OK, great. And we can do this pretty quickly, because I think we're going to get to yeah. audience questions pretty right. soon. Um, and also, it's upstairs on view, so we don't need to dwell on this too much. But as I mentioned, she gets this uh, Guggenheim Memorial Foundation grant in the mid 1975, which gives her seed money, basically, to start casting a lot of these foam sculptures that she's been making into heavier metals. And um, for everyone's benefit, I mean, metal casting is, has a long tradition in sculpture. It's often associated with monumental sculpture or um, equestrian statues. You know, it has a very long tradition. It's also kind of costly. So it is. Many artists, you know, they, once they reach a certain point, they're able to get to casting their work. That's wonderful. But a lot of artists, especially women artists in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they're not making the money their counterparts are, so they aren't able to cast. So she gets this grant. It allows her to start casting in heavier metals. She's experimenting with lead, um, aluminum, bronze, which of course bronze also has this very long sculptural tradition. Um, and it's really for her, she's just doing one-to-one -one castings. So she's taking a foam sculpture, mm -hmm. having a mold made, uh, and then casting it in bronze or lead or whatever. And this is a one-to-one -one thing. And I understand this as her really liking a form. She made, so she makes King of Flot, she makes Quartered Meteor in lead, and then she cast it again in bronze in 2018. So this is a sculpture that this form has been in her head for, from 69 to 2018. And how can she continue working with this form? She continues working with it by casting it in different metals. So it's this very much one-to-one -one relationship of taking a form and just casting it in a new material. Do you think it's about permanence? It is a little bit about permanence, although her foam sculptures are still with us. I mean, they're still, I know. they're pretty durable. I right. mean, it's, you know, this polyurethane polyurith foam. Right. Um, so it is a little bit about um, that. And this is something that was kind of in the, it was like, to do something so traditional as metal casting in the 1970s was kind of strange. Like Joel Shapiro is kind of the only other artist who's doing something similar. But again, it's like, why not? She has the money and she wants to work with different materials. She also has this great quote about working with metals. She's never poured metal, right? She's poured foam, she's poured paint, but she's never poured metal, and she said that that's because it doesn't have its own form. I have to find this quote. Let me think about this. But in the 60s when she's doing this, it, how involved is she in the process? That I don't know the answer to. She would have been working with a foundry, and so she would have you know, 
been basically. I just didn't know if she was literally pouring no. because we were talking yeah. about the polyurethane. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the latex. I mean, yes, she's talked always about how well I've I've poured paint, I've poured foam, I've sprayed, I've poured wax, I've painted with wax, I've sprayed foam, and so she's done all these different things, and so it's like she's just finding different ways for her to continue working with materials and forms. And of course, I'm not going to be able to find this quote. Um, but I'm sure if sure somebody <laughs> is going to be reading. Um, here we go. This is Benglis. I never directly poured metal, because metal itself doesn't have any form. Mm -hmm. But the idea of metal being a resource to contain and suggest movement and having the capacity to imply that it's illusionistically appearing to be water was natural, like volcano lava that suggests movement. Water again. Again, water and movement and flow. Yeah. Um, so metal casting, one-to-one. -one. What we're showing are enlargements. So this is like a, I have to refer to my notes because this is a very in-depth process. <laughs> She starts, these forms all originate from ceramics that are roughly the tabletop size, maybe a little bit larger. Um, she did a series called Elephant Necklace. There are actually over 50 elements, um, but in 2016, she arranged 37 of them into this circular form, creating a sculpture called Elephant Necklace. Yeah. Um, this is a process video really quick of her putting clay into an extruder. And you'll see she pulls the clay off the extruder and then quickly establishes a form on the table. And that's, that's the ceramic. And that was important for me to show because that extruder is what gives these kind of ridges. Um, and the edges have this kind of torn quality to them. That's coming from the extruder. So they start off as these ceramics, and then the process is she works with a fabricator to have a maquette-sized mold of this ceramic made. That's used to create, uh, th it's 3D scanned. Once it's in the computer, they use technology to enlarge it, so enlarge the proportions, mm -hmm. and then it's 3D printed at those new proportions, in new dimensions, in this putty-like material. Linda's able to kind of manipulate it further if she'd like. And then once she's approved the prototype, she goes on to cast it in these gorgeous reflective bronzes. So it's like she's done one-to-one -one casting, now she's doing enlargements. Willem de Kooning was a big influence on her work. Um, I think. We were talking about this just a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. and you said, yes, of course, the sculpture. But I do think that color, his color, had a huge impact. His painting? Yes. And his use of color had a huge impact on her. How so? I see there's like de Kooning pink, and you see de Kooning pink in a lot of Linda's work. Mm, that's interesting to yeah. think about. Um, but so de Kooning, you know, he also did this thing where he was um, enlarging smaller forms. We have 13. 12 of these small hand-formed bronze, okay, they're bronze sculptures. They were originally made in clay by de Kooning, um, you know, on a work table. Very quickly, um, they're very gestural, but they are evocative of um, bodies, and they are somewhat representational while still being pretty abstract. Um, and he enlarged three of those from that series into really monumental proportions. Um, there's a work on in our garden, Seated Woman, that's an enlargement mm -hmm. of these smaller versions. So she's has that in her head. Okay, this can be done. So I can keep working with this. So if I find a form that I like, not only can I experiment by making it in a different material, but I can also make it bigger. And it's interesting because I think de Kooning um, you know, he always vacillate. He always vacillated between the abstract and the figurative. Mm -hmm. um, but we see with like his woman series, yeah. for example, that um, maybe there's always figuration underneath yeah. all of his work. And um, 
I don't know, I was going to ask you, like, and I, I know you might want to move on, but, oh, no. um, like, when I was reading about reviews of these artworks and that sort mm -hmm. of thing, a lot of them compare them to industrial material, like mm. tires. Yeah, even Linda says that. Like, Does she? Yeah, they kind of, I mean, she was joking. When she, she came for the opening and I was asking her, you know, how do you, what are these ridges from? Like, are they from an extruder or what is this ridges that you see on these surfaces? And she said, oh, you know, a tractor trailer just drove over the clay, and like very deadpan. And I was like, oh. Like that literally happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she said, no, it's an extruder. But she liked this idea that they do look like blown out tires that you would see on the side of the road. That's interesting. And she's also described them as like remnants of the, um, it's like, a, it's a quote again, I'm not going to find it and I'm just going to misquote it horribly, but it's like, she likens them to the umbilical cord that ties us to the Garden of Eden. So there's a bodily reference yet again in the way she thinks about these. And I think about them, uh, I think about parts of them anyway as mm -hmm. orifices. Uh-huh, absolutely. So um, these are just some examples of the, for, you know, the original clay forms. So this would have been, this is for the elephant first foot forward, power tower, which is at the center of the gallery when you walk into the Nasher, and yellow tail, which is out on the terrace. Um, so you can just see that the dimensions alone, they're much smaller, they're in these... In the color. The color. Um, and she really wanted to work with these highly reflective bronze alloys because for her, this reflectivity adds this kind of speed and motion, so they have these kind of fast forms. Um, and again, I think it's to her interest in surface ornamentation. This shininess is like the sparkles that are and glitter that is on the paperwork. That's right. And, it, it's, and it's it, like the water that's falling from the fountain, which when water catches light, it sparkles. It, it's, and you shouldn't even disassociate it from color because it has yeah. its own patina, right? Yes. This is, um, quickly, I'll, I might not show this whole video. This, we're gonna jump ahead to the paper, um, chicken wire and glitter sculptures that are on view just above us. Um, they are the smallest works in the exhibition. They're also kind of the, the least durable. I mean, everything else is in bronze and these are like the very fragile. Very maybe. fragile, um, exactly. Fragile is a great word. But they also have a very close relationship to the body and their proportions. Um, and in the way that they're, these are hands-on objects that she makes in her studio. So they're very much a part of her studio practice. Whereas the bronze sculptures, she works with fabricators, she works with foundries, she works with computer technology. You know, they may start from a handmade form, they may be very haptic in their origins, but they go through so many different levels of you know, collaboration and input from mm. others. These, on the other hand, are incredibly Personal. Intimate, yeah. very personal, intimate. very intimate. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have described them as, I mean, she herself describes them as bodies. The chicken wire as this substrate representing kind of bones and the paper representing yeah. skin covering the bones. Um, she's talked about how, um, well, actually I've talked about it. So she, in 2016, she makes this discovery that she can add glitter to the paper slurry, and that glitter is what gives the paper its color in, in works that are made basically 2016 forward. And that's what she's making here. These are, these are handmade pieces of paper that she's added glitter to the slurry, so it's inherent to the paper, right? Yes. Whereas previous, she was applying color through paint, um, charcoal, sometimes gold leaf, to the paper. So it's this application of color onto a body. And then I think of like it as makeup on skin. Oh. And you think of like beautification yes. ritual. Yes. Yeah. Um, but then you also remember, we'll take it right back to the beginning. Yes. Louisiana <laughs> born. Uh, yes. A Louisiana native. And New Orleans, Mardi Gras parade floats, 
what are some of the primary ingredients oh, making a float? Yeah. Chicken wire and paper and glitter. And so I think there's a lot of different ways to think about these works. Um, but yeah, it, it some, you know, all roads lead back to Louisiana, I think, for Linda. <laughs> she talks about it a lot she in does. her work. <laughs> yes, in her writings. Um, I think, should we open for questions? Uh, just because, well, we, we can probably co cover, the rest of this is just fountain talk, and that's the end of it, so. Well, we can refer to it if it comes yeah. up in questions. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. I think because we're at 1, 2.30. <laughs> we talked a lot. We talked a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, let's hear from the audience. And, um, and we know we have um, a decent amount of artists in the audience, yeah. too. So Lee and I were talking about we'd love to hear your opinions about it. But go ahead. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the elephant series, mm -hmm. and how did she come up with that name? So I, I've talked to the studio. I've talked to Linda a little bit about titling. I mean, just in general, and sh titling of her work comes after the objects are made. Also, she's um, it's a very social. This is how it's been described to me. Very social thing. So she, oftentimes, just like riffing in the studio with. Oh, what does this look like to you? What does this look like to me? Um, she also has um, a strong relationship with India. She's lived in India for parts of her life. Um, she is incredibly well traveled. Incredibly well traveled. <laughs> she, there is a brick sculpture, a, a sculpture she made with bricks in India of an elephant form. And so I, I wonder if that has something to do with it. I mean, you know, she's always pulling from kind of past experience. Right. And past informs the present. Okay, well, it's really interesting. I um, went to Africa recently, and looking at those pieces and elephants and the shininess mm. as they're getting out of the water, mm. um, but then also not to be too graphic, um, but seeing a group of male elephants coming out of a water area mm -hmm. and not ever realizing um, their packages, and it was very much like as I was seeing that, I was like, "Oh, I and y'all brought it up, I, you know." So I'm making the I'm making the connection here, but it was very much that I was like, "Oh, I could totally see it." So that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I well, mean, it could be there. And we've been talking about bodies. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of bodies. Yeah. And, and trust me, um, it's something that you can never unsee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. I, I was just wondering, uh, so th this is purely from an aesthetic standpoint, but you did a show of Thomas Heatherwick's uh, mm -hmm. here, and he had these large extruded mm -hmm. benches. Yeah. The aesthetic of those in the fact that you have something that's refined and, and somewhat beautiful and yet then torn and ripped is there do you think there's some connection in in that aesthetically i guess between heatherwick and Bang Bang, th these pieces of bangles uh -huh. um, that they, they have this sense she's mimicking the clay the ripping and tearing of the clay yeah and i think for her it was really important that the enlargements while they're in bronze she wants you to wonder kind of like how did she get bronze to do that you know and where did these originate from and it's not uncommon many bronze sculptures originate as clay forms clay models so right. but um i think there's an effort in in other works in bronze to kind of mask not mask that but kind of diminish the origins of of clay as kind of the you know the first material and she's very interested in kind of emphasizing where these come from. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, though. Heatherwick and Benglis. I, it's, just, oh. it's just that aesthetic yeah. of, of process. Mm. Of, I mean, he was really showing the process and the ripping and tearing and what happens at the end of that extruding. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 Other thoughts? We have right. a really Please. important question. Um, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is my daughter. <laughs> well, you said like most people would consider like the colorfulness and like the glitter as like a feminine aesthetic and like the body. Um, but you said that she didn't consider her work as feminine. Mm -hmm. So like... Don't ask Lee, ask me. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you both said that it was like colorful and had glitter, and most people would consider that as feminine. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that she's adding that to her work and yet saying that it's not feminine aesthetic? Well, that's a good question. It's a great question. You start. You start, and then I'll finish. <laughs> I have her all day. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I would, I would try to respond to that, which is a great question. Um, I think she was pushing back against the idea that glitter and color can only be feminine, and that why does it have to be feminine? Yeah. Um, can't boys like glitter and color too? Can't, can't men use glitter and color too? And when they do, like Frank Stella, who we have a work up upstairs, he also used color and glitter in his sculpture, but it was kind of seen as a bad thing. We've come a little bit, I'm not gonna say we've come a long way since the 70s in terms of our gendered notions of art, but we have come a little bit further, so I think to, in today's day and age, that would be probably like a photo, like people would not say these things. But at the time that um, Benglis was making her work and applying glitter and using really bright colors um, that we might call feminine, um, that was her way of kind of showing like, I like these things, but I don't know why just because I'm a woman that means they have to be feminine. And I think she was saying anybody can use them. Yeah, like it is is pink for girls, right? Because yeah. she creates work with a lot of color, but also includes a lot of pink. Like, does that have to be identified with gender? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it more in the car. <laughs> Great question. Other questions? I think Kathy and I were also saying like, as academics, curators, we have a, a very different relationship to this work. And I think having artists in the audience, if you could maybe speak to what you think about the work, what do you think about the work? Because uh, there is a knowledge that comes from working with materials that I don't have. And with an artist like Linda Benglis, the materials are so important. The process is so important. And that's what she talks about a lot, yeah. especially in recent years. Yeah, for sure. Is the process of making mm -hmm. and the materials. So we didn't know if you guys had feedback about that. Mm -hmm. Hi, so I've recently actually been working with a lot of chicken wire and foam personally within my work <laughs> for um, working towards my master's of fine arts degree. But I wonder, would she have ever considered then applying any internal structure report, support before then putting any type of uh, expanding foam? Because expanding mm -hmm. foam nowadays can go from anything from like a half an inch all the way up to like five inches. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, what gauge was she at? Did she have something inside there? Or was she just strictly free pouring every single time and then computer come like modifying them via computer and 3D model later? Yeah, so when she was working with the foam, you know, she, she was kind of building on the knowledge that she had developed from pour, pouring latex paint. And so basically just pouring layer on top of layer and letting those kind of build up but they weren't really getting terribly volum voluminous in that method because, as you say, there's only so much, of how, you know, foam can only expand so much. Right. 
So how, how do you continue making larger forms with this material? And so as she starts making those kind of cantilevered um, sculptures that I mentioned that come off the wall, if I can pull up an image. Oh, I'm, not, I'm getting away from it. Okay, so as she's making these cantilevered forms, she's having to figure out ways to support the foam um, as it's kind of like jumping off the wall. So this is a great image because you see there's chicken wire. So she's still using the chicken wire as a substrate. She's put plastic over it because she probably didn't want that chicken wire, that hexagonal pattern to be so much a part of the bottom, you know, the surface of it. Um, but also so the foam wouldn't drip through the chicken wire before it had time to kind of harden and rise up. So underneath that wire, as far as I understand, she was also building out, you know, wood kind of structures that the chicken wire would go over. Um, she goes on to make a, a bronze fountain that was based off of a, a pour, a foam pour, that is, it kind of juts out of mm -hmm. the ground, right? Or out of the pool that it would be installed in because it's a right. fountain. And the way she achieved this kind of, it looks like a wave and it's called, I think, the wave. Um, the way she achieved that is she used a weather balloon and in, you know, with helium or some, she inflated a weather balloon, then pour, then put the chicken wire, then put the plastic, and then poured on top of that. So, as she's pouring that foam, while it's still in its more viscous state, it's, you know, finding its shape, very organically and just kind of by chance. But then, as it hardens and becomes rigid, she can pop that balloon, and she has this sculpture that has this that incredible. Has that arc. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty impressed by that, but yeah. I didn't know about the balloon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Victoria. Are you going to use water balloons now? <laughs> <laughs> or you can start pouring in uh, water directly in a swimming pool. <laughs> I've been trying to figure out how to form this into a question, but I think it's just more a couple of thoughts. Um, one about uh, the scanning process, so mm -hmm. scanning these forms to enlarge them, and um, whether you know how much Linda might have been involved in that, but sort of what that means in the material space mm -hmm. and how we interpret hand and process in the three-dimensional space, um, something that is a space that's very intangible, mm -hmm. but absolutely a, a, a way to work and think about space mm -hmm. um, and how that then might translate through the larger forms with maybe extra information or missing information. Mm -hmm. um, and is also sort of an eternal, has sort of this alternate al eternal life in the, the sort of digital file form is also interesting. So I was been thinking about that. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a big a topic. Ceramics professor. Oh, okay. Cool. He knows cool. a lot about this stuff. Okay. Um, You're going to teach me something <laughs> in this question, I think. <laughs> and and just sort of as a side note, I, I can't help but think about a local um, artist named Dan Lamb, who also yeah, does absolutely. a lot of pours and um, is sort of thinking in similar ways in uh, even, I don't know, like more contemporary foams and resins and translucency and um, space. So just yeah. thinking about that. You got anything? I mean, <laughs> Dan Lamb is lovely, wonderful artist. She showed as part of Nash Republic upstairs in our public gallery one of her sculptures that was a poured form, but it had an architectural element. You could walk underneath it. And then it had this other digital component where she worked with, uh, she collaborated with other artists to um, projection map. Mm -hmm. So it was this form that already kind of implied movement, like it was melting, but then this added um, element of this um, projection mapping actually made you look like, it was animated basically, like you could see, it almost looked like it was melting right there in your space. Right. Um, 
Okay, so the other question. <laughs> um, I've got some notes. Ellie. <laughs> Just think about it. Just love to think about. It. I, I okay. I can I can say that I, I don't know how involved she is once it gets 3D scanned. Like I, I think that the the 3D scanning really is a, a way for them to capture as much information from the original form. Um, so it, it so that information doesn't get lost once it's translated into the larger mm -hmm. uh, bronze. Um, and it's also a way to get those dimensions into a computer, which can then do a very accurate, you know, it, you know, uh, enlargement of those dimensions and forms. That's it. And then once it's printed 3D, um, from what I understand, it's it's printed in this putty-like material. So Linda's able to then go in and have a tangible relationship with the object before it's then cast in this um, heavier metal that is impossible then to manipulate, mm -hmm. if that makes any. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's that sort of um, uh, manipulatable, m or sort of the, the point which one could manipulate the form in the 3D space and then spit it back out and manipulate it again. So you could, ha there's a conversation there yeah. even. Um, so, and anyway, just thinking about that. Thanks. <laughs> I'll share. I'll share my notes. <laughs> um, other questions? Got one. Oh, Grace. <laughs> no, it's okay, baby. Um, so she likes. She. You said that she does a lot of like liquids and stuff, like the fountain. And um, like she pours the like foam onto the chicken wire. Do you think there's any specific reason that she use that she like adds like bodily fluids or liquids in to her art? Well, she doesn't add bodily fluids to her art. <laughs> yeah, but, but. Uh, <laughs> other artists do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there's that. Um, there's a piece by Judy Chicago called Ablutions, which is about mm -hmm. like basically putting bodily fluids in your art. And um, Andy Warhol peed on copper. I know, right? I'll show you that when we get home. Um, <laughs> called his oxidation paintings, but. Um, I think she's just referencing something physical and bodily through her paint and through her processes and materials, something that's connected to the body. Mm -hmm. And we all excrete things mm -hmm. in various ways. Yes. Estelle has a question. Jump, jumping off, Gracie. I, I, sorry. Um, well, first of all, I thought it was really interesting that she quotes um, Beauvoir in saying that, so I'm assuming this is from the second sex, or maybe not, when she's oh, saying that on. she's not a, f she doesn't need to be included. She doesn't say it, it Eva was, Hess does. Yeah. Oh, Eva Hess, oh, there we go, okay. But <laughs> but I, I think that, and I don't mean to interrupt your question, but I think that Benglis has similar feelings to Hess in that she's not necessarily seeing her work as feminist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or feminine, but more bodily. But keep going. So my my question has to do with the water, because in to me, water in the divine feminine, it has to do with just the idea that it that she's allowing it to find its form, um, that it's it it taps into the mystery and and what I see as feminine qualities when we're looking at, you know hard, soft, or, mm. you know, light, dark, and the, well, right. The, and I was just wondering if she ever speaks to that, about the idea of that, that quality of the, the water, although we all have bodily fluids, but to me. How is water connected to the feminine for you? <sighs> Earth? Um, because it has to do with the unconscious. It has to do with the mystery. It has to do with our menses. It has to, I mean, I know men ejaculate, and there's also references to that with the fountain. But to me, water is is the mystery, is the psyche, is mm -hmm. the, it, it is the feminine to me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know. My, my husband always tells me that the first philosopher, I forget his name, um, his most famous quote is, everything is water. <laughs> um, but I'm sure that there's elements to that, don't you think? Sure. Um, and as phallic as they may seem, um, I think that there's a connection to the other gender, mm -hmm. so to speak. But that's, that's a great point. Last question, I think. Um, I just had a comment also about the fountains. Um, it's funny that you reference them as, um, I mean, maybe masculine only in that there's, they're vertical and there's the phallic reference, but I've, I see them as extraordinarily feminine. They're vessels, they're stacked vessels, and the water doesn't spew out like some, you know, a lot of fountains do. It, it actually right. just, it oozes down and it trickles down. And um, so just because, I think it's interesting that we think something is masculine just because it's erect. But, um, I know, but we're we're all vertical. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're we all stand up. We're tall. Some of us are you know, very tall, and um, and this is actually their stacked um, vessels that are holding and then spilling over. And there's something very. And I actually think it. that Benglis thought of it in part that way. Um, if you look at her other fountains, mm -hmm. I think she's thinking about them as these vessel-like structures. I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. She calls them cornucopias, but she mm. calls them active cornucopias. Active? Yes. As opposed to passive, like on your dinner table for Thanksgiving, you have a cornucopia. It's lying on its side. It that's may, passive. That's passive. These are active. They're upright, and they're overflowing with abundance. Yeah. Should we end? Yeah, I think so. Um, thank you guys so much yeah. for coming. Thank you. We really appreciate it. <laughs>